Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Crispin Davies. I'm one of the PhD students here in the department. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking to you about nonlinear model predictive control, simulation based analysis, and unmanned aerial vehicles. So, a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to start off with a bit of background. That's the problem that I'm working on. I'm going to introduce nonlinear model predictive control. I'm going to talk about simulation based analysis and I'm going to conclude with some of my future work. The first two of these points are going to take very little time. Simulation-based analysis is when we'll get where we're going to be spending the bulk of our time today. So consider for a moment search and rescue. You have a disaster that's occurred. An example might be this one here. There's an entire area, possibly a city, possibly a nation, that has been destroyed. It's a very dangerous place. There's th hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe millions of people who need rescuing and medical attention within this area. And one of the key tools for search and rescue responders in the modern world are unmanned aerial vehicles, kind of similar to this uh, thrust vectoring quad rotor that we've developed here at the UC. So this quad rotor provides not only the ability to fly around like a traditional quad rotor, but the thrust vectoring allows you to build much larger quad rotors. So in this case, we can use things like multispectral imaging which sensors are quite large, to survey the area and to identify people who need medical attention and to actually figure out how best to go about uh, rescuing them. So for that though, we've added, in addition to the four propeller speed controls, four tilt rotor controls as well. That gives us eight things we have to control actively at any given time. And traditional control approaches aren't capable of handling that level of complexity. So we need something more. Here we're bringing in a new control schema, specifically nonlinear model predictive control. Now, this control schema has been used in other areas. Uh, the most notable area would be process engineering, but it's never really been applied to unmanned aerial vehicles quite to the degree that we need for vehicles like our TV quad to fly. So, what is nonlinear model predictive control? Well, it's a fundamentally different control premise. Instead of computing what the control output should be based on the current state, we do a guess and test method and we use sampling to figure out what's the best control option. So the process is depicted here uh, where we start off with generating a sample. So let's say that's sample A and sample B. These are two different things that I could do with my control system and I have to figure out which one I should do. We then predict where the vehicle will go as a result of each of these samples. So sample A takes me here, sample B takes me there. And then we do a cost analysis to choose the best sample. Sample A has a cost of five, sample B has a cost of seven, so I would choose sample A because it costs less. Cost may be things like fuel usage, it may also be things like incurred risk. If I fly close to a building, I'm more likely to crash. What this allows us to do, uh, which other controls schemes can't do is it allows us to predict future behavior and to make controlled decisions not based on what's happening now but based on what will happen in the future. And it allows, because of its structure, a free form of logic and math. So we're not restricted to trying to create mathematical expressions to describe the environment. We can also use logic and learning-based tools as well. Now there are a couple of problems with nonlinear model predictive control. The first of those arises from the fact that it is an optimization process. So when we are guessing and testing, we don't know how good our initial guesses will be. They might be as high as a cost of 2.5, they might start as low as a cost of 0.5 in this particular example, and maybe the median value would be one. But as we take more samples, say 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, these costs all converge to a single point and we get the optimum solution. The problem for unmanned aerial vehicles arises when these costs are, we don't have the time to evaluate all of these costs for all of these samples and the system becomes probabilistically erratic or stochastic. So all of a sudden we say you have a thousand samples, well we don't know what cost we're going to get when we take only a thousand samples. Um, so that makes traditional analysis tools inappropriate. Suffice it to say we've created a new no, uh, nonlinear model predictive control system which alleviates some of this load. But I'm not going to cover the exact specifics, I'm just going to give you the, the brief details for today. So we've improved the optimization approach, that's how samples are generated. We've improved the vehicle modeling approach to make it more efficient. And we've improved the cost analysis process. 
These all help to make the system more stable and more reliable, but they don't solve the problem entirely. So what we need is the, a new analysis schema or some tool to actually go in and say, how good is this controller actually? If I go and put it on a vehicle, will it fly safely or will it not? Because all of our traditional tools don't work as soon as the system becomes stochastic. So what we're introducing today and kind of the big part of my talk is called simulation-based analysis. This is a very old concept, but we're presenting it in a new light. So the whole idea is we run a simulation, we look at the results of the simulation, and we say, huh, the, v the vehicle and the control system did well this time. If you get enough of those simulations over enough possible scenarios uh, that the vehicle has to fly under, you can say reliably, well, I think the control system will do pretty good. So the process itself starts off with simulation. So we connect the control system to a simulator, and we use those two in uh, conjunction to figure out what would actually happen to the vehicle under a given scenario. Maybe we hit it with an impulse. Maybe we blow on it with wind. Maybe we ask it to move over to the other side of the room. Each of these would be scenarios, and we would simulate the results from them. Then we would apply Fourier analysis to give us the frequency spectrum of the vehicle data as it's uh, produced. So if the vehicle is tracking its position over time, we can look at the frequency spectrum of that data to actually pull out, say, 1 hertz oscillation, 5 hertz oscillation, 10 hertz oscillation, and I'll show you what this looks like in a little bit. We can then do a linear regression to figure out how uh, quickly those uh, frequency components are growing and shrinking. We want them all to be shrinking for a stable system. And then that provides us with the ability to create a flight envelope. So that allows us to test the system for stability, robustness, and fragility, which is essentially how well is the system actually performing. So let's actually go through each of those elements because I kind of blew through them really quickly. So first off, we have simulation. To do this, uh, we need to produce kind of the realistic effects for how the vehicle would behave in reality if we actually had the physical vehicle flying. So what we do is we use multi-body physics to replicate the dynamics of the vehicle to a very high degree of accuracy. In our case specifically, I'm using Featherstone's recursive formulation, but you really can use any multi-body physics uh, system to accomplish the same goal. We've also extended these multi-body physics to cover a whole bunch of physical effects. Example, it would include uh, motor dynamics, propeller modeling to create the actual aerodynamic effects of the propellers as the vehicle's trying to fly, although we're not taking into account ground and wall effects like you're working on, Daniel. Uh, and that gives us a higher level of accuracy in our simulations. So this gives us a better output as far as will our simulation behave the same way as the physical real system does. With that, we produce a whole bunch of actual data for the vehicle as it's flying. So this is an actual test run, and these are the position and velocity outputs for a vehicle, uh, a quad rotor specifically flying with a PID controller on it. So you can see its position in X, Y, and Z after it got hit with an impulse, and it's kind of oscillating back and forth as it steadies itself out. This is what a stable controller should do. You should see these waves slowly progressing down to zero, and the system comes back to a steady state in the middle. This is the output that comes out of the simulator. So that's kind of step one. Next, we do a Fourier transform of that output. So this is kind of the same as with the music uh, visualization. If you're watching something like Winamp or on your computer, or on your radio, and that kind of stuff, and it shows you the little frequency bars that are bouncing up and down, this is the same concept. So you've got the Fourier analysis over 0 hertz all the way up to 500 hertz in this particular test, and we have that for the first 80 seconds of time. That tells us approximately how big each wave is within our uh, plots. And if you remember, the plots look kind of like a sinusoid wave that was dying out. Well, those frequencies are the ones that you're seeing here, and they're progressively dying out over time uh, as a result of the control system controlling the vehicle. From those Fourier transforms, we can then do a linear regression or a line of best fit over that data progressively. And that'll tell us approximately the slope that, that, data, or that the uh, system error is decreasing with. We want that slope to get smaller and smaller and smaller as the system goes on. And you can see in our particular test here that all of the slopes are negative. So that means that the system is trending towards zero frequency component, which is what we want. When all the frequency components are zero, the system is sitting there steady. Uh, and finally, the end result of all of this is it provides you with a flight envelope. 
a flight envelope essentially tells you this is the region of conditions within which the vehicle can fly safely. So we can actually test a whole bunch of different conditions, look at the data that comes out of there, decide whether this data is stable or not using the process that I just ran through, and that will actually tell you if you hit the vehicle with this kind of an impulse, will the vehicle crash or will it actually come back and steady itself out? And in this, or in this particular set of tests, we've hit it with impulses in the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, and we found the volume, which is that colored region, um, for where the vehicle was actually safely flying. Colors here indicate from blue uh, that it didn't have very much difficulty dealing with those impulses to red where it did have a lot of difficulty. So why would we want this kind of analysis? Well, first off, this is an analysis methodology that allows us to test these new control systems. Previous methodologies don't allow for this, so that's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, second, this allows us to incorporate greater realism in tests. We can actually include effects like wind gusting uh, in a semi-random fashion in these tests. And finally, we can investigate some interesting hypotheses about nonlinear model predictive control. So quickly to conclude, what I've presented here for you today is nonlinear model predictive control, uh, which is a new control methodology that we're pro proposing, and simulation-based analysis, which is a new analysis methodology that we're proposing. And that will lead kind of to the future work, which is mainly combining the two. So we're going to be combining both the systems and actually running the tests. Uh, we're going to be comparing this with a new control or another controller as kind of like a control variable. Uh, and we're going to verify all my hypotheses about nonlinear model predictive control being as great as I claimed that it was. Any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>